Hello, today is June 9th, 2016. I am Susan Silk, the Director of the Division of Policy and Education at OLA. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Allison J. Bennett to OLA Online Seminars to present Balancing Public Interest, Benefits, and Risks in Animal Research. Allison J. Bennett, PhD, is Associate Professor of Psychology and Faculty Director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Animal Program. She is a developmental psychobiologist whose research has advanced scientific insight into how social and physical environments get under the skin to affect behavior and health across the lifespan. Professor Bennett teaches courses in research methods and animal cognition. She has a long-standing commitment to public education about science, animal welfare, and research ethics. Dr. Bennett is a former chair and current member of the American Psychological Association's Committee on Animal Research Ethics and serves on the executive committee of the International Advocacy Group Speaking of Research. Welcome to Ola, Dr. Bennett. Thank you, Dr. Silk, and thank you to Drs. Hampton and Ola for inviting me, and Brown, for inviting me to share in this webinar and to discuss the topic of ethical consideration that protects the public interest in scientific advances resulting from animal research. What I'll talk about today are approaches and factors that play a role in the process of weighing, balancing scientific goals, specific research objectives, and animal welfare. Sometimes this is called benefit-risk analysis, and sometimes it's called harm-benefit analysis. However, it is really not, as that label sometimes is thought to imply, some form of mathematical analysis. Nor is it the kind of equation that can be solved objectively, and so I won't offer a template for doing that. Rather, what we're talking about is a thoughtful process that is undertaken in order to inform decisions in a way incorporates a range of expert knowledge, public expectations, and estimation of likely outcomes from different choices. That's a process that occurs at many levels, by individuals, by different groups. And it's a process that informs decisions about what research should be conducted, about how to minimize potential for negative impact on animal welfare, and how to balance the two. This is in no way a new concept, nor is it a new process. It's one with a very long history, and it is a fundamental consideration that underlies decisions and actions by scientists, science and health agencies, and by the public. In many ways, the process is so integral to decisions that it may not always be explicitly described in formal terms, or in terms of strategies for analysis, and specifically in terms of weighing scientific objectives in animal welfare. Perhaps as a result, it can sometimes be the case that the fact that evaluation of benefit, of risk and balance that occurs regularly part of a review is not always widely appreciated or understood. So reviewing how that process occurs, where it occurs, and what factors are involved is the subject of this webinar. The IACUC is one of the groups that plays an important role in this process. Their role is largely focused on evaluation of procedures and potential impact on research animals. How that evaluation occurs and whether there is a need for a different type of accounting of the process has been a recent topic of increasing interest. For example, we've seen proposals for worksheets and scores, color-coded graphic representations of relative benefit and risk, and even mathematical algorithms. In each case, the general idea is that by assigning categories and scores, tallying them up, a metric can somehow be established that will give us answers to complex moral questions. What I'll talk about today is why a meaningful weighing of scientific objectives in animal welfare is a process, one that occurs at multiple levels. It is a process that must be informed by understanding how science works, by appreciation of the time scales between discovery and translation, by consideration of the value of basic knowledge and of no null findings, and finally, 
by the risk and likely outcomes of doing nothing at all, what's called the harm of in. Each of these is fundamentally important to decisions about research and to decisions that protect the public's interest in scientific progress that benefits humans, other animals, society, and the environment. As is appropriate for an OLA webinar, I will focus on the U.S. on publicly funded research with animals, in particular on basic science, and on understanding the core principles in our system for evaluation and review. Where I will start today is at the beginning with first questions. The best place to start in identifying a good process is often to first ask why. Why is analysis of potential benefit versus potential risk required? And assuming that the requirement is meaningful, not simply a box checking exercise, the question of why it is expected or sometimes even required is related to its goal. So the second question is simply, what is the goal? What is it that the analysis should accomplish? And what would success in accomplishing that goal look like? Understanding one of a number of reasons that we consider the balance between scientific objectives and animal welfare begins with the fact that in the US, research with non-human animals depends on a social contract with the American public. Research occurs because the public finds benefit in it and, via the democratic process, allows for it by law. In the U.S., as in other countries, humans interact with non-human animals in many different ways. These include using animals for food, clothing, labor, entertainment, and companionship. However, in the U.S., as in many other countries, it is only the use of animals in research that requires, by law, formal ethical justification. Now that is not to say that other activities are exempt from law, standards, and ethical consideration. That wouldn't be true. But it is research with non-human animals that requires, by law, ethical justification. And that requirement can be summarized with a set of core principles. At its core, the framework for ethical consideration of animal research in the U.S. is that it only be conducted under the following conditions. First, when there are no feasible alternatives to achieve the same objective or purpose. And second, when the work has potential benefit and the scientific objectives are balanced with consideration of animal welfare. The public stake in research includes benefiting from the results of scientific study. That may be benefit to human health, to other animals, to society, or to the environment. Acknowledgement of and desire for that benefit is reflected in public funding for science. That includes public funding of the National Institutes of Health and funding for animal studies that are critically important to the NIH's mission to improve scientific understanding and public health. Thus, research is in the public's interest and ultimately for public benefit. At the same time, the public, along with the research community, have an interest in balancing scientific objectives and the benefits of research with their concern for animal welfare. Thus, another condition of research is that animal welfare standards are upheld in order to ensure responsible, humane treatment and every effort to reduce unnecessary harm. We can distill public interest in animal research into these two statements. Foremost, those animals are in research for a reason, and it is one that is morally justifiable. And second, when animals are in laboratories, they receive excellent, humane care. In other words, because the sole ethical justification for having animals in research facilities at all is the science the scientific objectives must be balanced in decisions about the animal's care and treatment. These two principles are what guide our decisions about research and about care for animals. That's true at the level of individuals, institutions, organizations, and federal agencies. The remaining question is how does the public know that these conditions are met? It is for this other reason, how the public knows, 
that our responsibility is not only to consider the ethical justification for research, but also to communicate about the process to the broader public. That is not a checkbox kind of activity. Rather, it is a broad set of principles that are shared in order to accurately convey what it is we are doing, what we know, and what we don't know. That can include the considerations we use in decisions, the scientific objectives and how they are balanced with consideration of animal welfare, our evaluation of procedures, and our humane animal care. We can also share our knowledge and experiences with the factors that play a role in assessing benefit and risk. We can share information about why and when alternatives are or are not feasible, as well as why that is specifically. But what we must also share is a full and inclusive acknowledgement of the different levels of review and analysis from the scientists to study sections at NIH to local IACUCs. What we should be sharing is not only the goals of different evaluations, but also the inherent limitations of any decision-making process. In other words, our obligation includes being clear about the nature of science, the scientific process, and what cannot be done or known with certainty ahead of making decisions. So going back to the first questions about process, understanding why we consider benefits and risk, what our goal is, what a successful process might look like. Our goal is not only to fulfill our own moral obligation to balancing scientific objectives with animal welfare, but also to convey how we fulfill this commitment to the public. Thus, evaluating success in reaching that goal is going to depend partly on how well we convey the factors involved in the analysis, including the full range of a complicated process that cannot be reduced to a simple computing scheme that can be applied on a case-by-case -case basis to compute a score in an automated decision. Well, given that complexity, what can we say about ethical consideration of animal research? First, we can say that the overarching goal or core principle guiding decisions about research is to ensure that scientific goals, new knowledge, and discoveries are met. In other words, the scientific community performs research that the public supports and from which it benefits, as is shown in the graphic here. At the same time, those scientific objectives are balanced with compassion and commitment to our moral obligation for humane care and treatment of research animals. The next question is how we judge the merits of research projects and the balance of scientific objectives in animal welfare. There could be many ways to judge, opinion polls, popularity, surveys, but what the public expects and what occurs in the U.S. system for evaluation of federally funded research is that the judgments are based largely in facts and in expert knowledge. One of the reasons for that, as I will discuss here, is that knowledge is essential to best identifying the most likely outcomes of a set of actions or decisions. And for animal research, there's a range of knowledge and different types of expertise that play a role in that evaluation and in decisions. This process for evaluating potential benefits, risk, and the balance of scientific objectives in animal welfare occurs at many different levels in the U.S. system. It involves a range of individuals and groups, as shown in this slide. The first among these are researcher selection of questions, methods, and experimental design. In simplest terms, of all the research studies and questions that scientists could pursue, those they choose are not random. Rather, they are selected on the basis of the importance of the question, the strength of the hypothesis, and the likelihood of success. And furthermore, the methods in experimental design are selected to be the most likely to succeed in testing a hypothesis and providing meaningful data. It is not only the researcher, though, who evaluates the previous slide. 
It is not only the researcher who evaluates whether the question is important or whether the hypothesis and rationale are sound, whether the methods and design are likely to produce meaningful data. Funding agencies such as the NIH also critically evaluate proposals for research. They do this through expert scientific review panels and also through selection of priorities for NIH's mission to improve public health. And in addition to funding agencies, scientific review occurs prior to publication of study findings. Scientific organizations, journals, and funding agencies also have ethical codes that include expectations for weighing scientific objectives and standards for animal welfare and care. In addition to scientists, funding agencies, scientific organizations, and journals, there are also external agencies charged with formulating standards and providing oversight for animal research. These include both the USDA and NIH's OLAW, for example. And finally, institutions may choose to seek voluntary accreditation from private organizations such as ALAC. So when we look at the system of review of animal research in the U.S., we can see that there are clearly different groups and levels of review. There are also common principles and core considerations. For example, there are a number of key factors and concepts that play a role in thinking about the balance of scientific objectives in animal welfare. Those include such things as potential benefit, including the benefit and importance of null results. It includes potential risk and actual harms, as well as the harm of inaction. It includes time scales between discovery and realized benefit and the range of impact of findings and discoveries. I will address each of these in turn. First, evaluating both potential benefit and potential harm begins with identifying interest holders. That is, who and what are potentially affected by a decision to conduct research. As shown here, that can be individuals, species, society, the environment, or some combination. For example, the interest holders may be the potential beneficiaries of the research, which could be humans and society. But it is also those in research, which could be research animals. It's important to keep in mind, though, that this includes those affected by both the action or the choice of inaction. What do I mean? For example, in research aimed at developing a vaccine for Zika virus, those affected would include those at risk for Zika virus. A choice to do the research would potentially benefit those individuals. Conversely, a choice not to do the research or not to address the health threat would likely result in harm from inaction. No research increases the likelihood of no vaccine or no progress in better understanding the health threat. After identifying potential interest holders, shown here as columns, the next consideration is of how those interest holders are affected, shown as rows, the potential benefit and the potential risk. In this slide, we are bringing this information together in one place. Putting together the identifying a range of interest holders and the potential outcomes allows for a broad and inclusive ethical consideration as is shown in this model. And the purpose of bringing all this together is to represent the factors that inform responsible decisions about research. So if we look at this model, we see what informs ethical consideration, what can drive decisions by Iacooks and others. I hope this diagram will be useful to you, and if you'd like more information, I've included the reference at the bottom of the slide here. So at the heart of the process we are engaged in when thinking about these issues is really the question of what is morally justifiable. And in part, what we are evaluating is whether the scientific objectives are balanced with consideration of animal welfare, or whether potential benefits outweigh the potential harms. What is difficult, however, is that the weighing must occur in advance of conducting the work. 
So the evaluation occurs prior to an action and is of potential rather than actual consequences. The actual consequences can only be evaluated after the action. That is, because in science, we do not know the answer to the question ahead of doing the research. If we did, we would not do the study. The study is aimed at producing new knowledge, determining the answer to a question where the outcome is as of yet unknown. Thus, our evaluation is based in predicting likely outcomes of action. We make that judgment not out of random opinion, but based in known facts, solid rationale, expert analysis. Nonetheless, it is a prediction and it's not a guarantee. Given that evaluations and decisions must occur ahead of taking the action and without a guaranteed outcome, what are the factors then that are considered? Some of those possible outcomes, potential consequences, what we don't know, what we consider, are listed here. First is the likelihood that the study will succeed. What is critical to remember on this point is what is considered a success. In science, success does not mean only a statistically significant positive result. In fact, null results and failures are critical features, positive features of science. Ruling out hypotheses is important to critical evaluation of theories, to establishing facts, and to making progress in understanding. In other words, it is an inherent feature, not a bug, of the scientific method. For that reason, likelihood that a study will be successful revolves around a well-developed hypothesis, approach, and method. And in turn, the evaluation considers the likelihood that the study will produce useful knowledge. What we also consider is the benefit that the study may have, what it might accomplish, and what kind of benefit it might yield, and to whom those benefits might accrue. Alongside evaluation of the scientific objectives is the evaluation of potential harm, the risk of research. In the case of animal research, risk and harms are typically considered in terms of effects on animal welfare. Here, the goal is to balance the scientific objectives with the animal's welfare, taking care to minimize potential for unnecessary suffering, pain, or distress. The other thing to consider on the potential harm side is the risk of doing nothing at all and the consideration of who bears that harm. For example, if we choose not to do research to better understand brain development, epigenetics, immune function, Parkinson's disease, Zika virus, neonatal lung development, and so on, whose lives will be affected? And in what ways? Together, these are some of the considerations that underlie evaluation and decisions about whether or not to conduct a research project. That is true whether the process is formally articulated in this manner or not, because these are the core questions and factors at the heart of our review systems. And they are also the questions that scientists wrestle with in choosing research topics, specific studies, and study designs. In each case, however, it remains a fact that the evaluation necessarily takes place before the study is conducted. Decisions have to be made in the absence of knowing the outcome. But that doesn't mean we have no source of information that can guide our decisions and the process by which we evaluate research. In fact, we can gain very useful knowledge by turning to what we do know. As is the case for other moral dilemmas and societal challenges, we can learn from history. In the case of research, we can learn from post hoc analysis. And here, I don't mean some kind of very short term, say, five year retrospective analysis meant to count up the number of animals in a study and assess whether or not a single study resulted in a cure for a disease. What I do mean is that post hoc analysis is aimed at broad questions, aimed at better understanding the nature of science and what it means in terms of reasonable expectations. For example, the concept of time scales or what the time between discoveries and realized benefit may be for interest holders. 
I will turn now to two specific examples that illustrate the use of post hoc analysis. There are many more. I've chosen these as familiar topics that illustrate each of the concepts quite well. The first example is the discovery of insulin as a treatment for diabetes. The outcome of that discovery is quite clear. What you'll see here is an early patient before and four months after treatment with insulin. In fact, although many may forget now, prior to the discovery and availability of insulin, the prognosis for children with diabetes was suffering in a fair certainty of early death. If we view the process, not a single study, but the entire process by which the role of insulin in diabetes, the basic understanding, and the development of insulin as a treatment was developed, we can rapidly gain appreciation for time scales in research and the breadth of studies and testing with a range of animals that was needed to get to that point. In brief, in 1879, we have the critical foundational discovery that the pancreas produces insulin. How did that happen? By removing the pancreas from a healthy dog that then developed the symptoms of diabetes. Not a correlational approach, but the definitive experimental approach to establish causation. Nearly 30 years later, Insulin from healthy dogs was injected into diabetic dogs. The diabetic dogs were restored to their normal state. The next step was to refine the extraction of insulin from the pancreas of cattle, then to test the dose, purity, and safety of insulin with rabbits serving as test subjects prior to the use of insulin for humans with diabetes. By 1922, the first human patient received insulin. We now widely appreciate the benefit that insulin provided. What the post hoc analysis tells us is that the benefit was realized only after a time scale of roughly 40 years. That is, four decades, involving studies and testing with dogs, cattle, and rabbits. If a five-year retrospective analysis had been done following the 1879 initial discovery, what would the conclusion have been? Probably, the study would have been judged as a complete failure if the metric for success had been the number of lives saved or whether it had produced a cure for diabetes. The case of insulin and diabetes is informative, but the example I will turn to next provides perhaps a better illustration of how basic research works, of unanticipated outcomes, and the inherent difficulty in predicting the range of benefits from a particular set of scientific studies. The example I will use is a very brief history of the discovery of the brain chemical serotonin. Many people know about serotonin because it is involved in a wide range of behaviors and health outcomes. Among them, depression, anxiety, sleep, eating, impulsivity, alcoholism. What may be less widely appreciated is how it is that we came to know about serotonin and how we learned about what it does in the brain. That story begins with the discovery of enteramine by a scientist named Erspommer. What was Erspommer doing? looking for the substance in blood that caused smooth muscle contraction. A little over 10 years later, another group of scientists who were working on understanding vasoconstrictors identified serotonin, which is also in teramine. What happened next was rapidly moving from determining the structure of serotonin, creating synthetic serotonin to facilitate research aimed at better understanding the substance, but it was not until 1954, nearly 20 years after the initial discovery, that a scientist named Betty Turog discovered serotonin was in the mammalian brain. And it was that critical discovery, building on all of the previous studies, that provided the foundation for a new theory that had a critical and lasting impact. Nearly 10 years after Turog's discovery, a scientist named D.W. Woolley built upon the new knowledge of brain function to hypothesize that psychoses or some forms of mental illness had a biochemical basis. He hypothesized that serotonin was key to diseases like depression. That basic research occurred over a 35-year time span 
and with a range of animals that included cattle, clams, frogs, rabbits, and primates. It provided the foundation for the development of targeted pharmacotherapies for depression. By 1970, the first selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants, were developed. And although it is true that we continue to learn and develop new treatments for depression, and that the current treatments do not work for everyone, there can be no doubt that as a result of these studies and the development of antidepressants, suffering was alleviated and continues to be in a great many people. These brief examples, two out of many, illustrate some of the fundamental principles that must play a role in considering the potential outcomes of scientific research. They provide a powerful demonstration that the time between discoveries and realized benefits is often in the time scale of decades. Not a year, not five years, 30, 40, or more. Furthermore, when we step back and consider time scales, we see that the realized benefits of the discovery of serotonin did not end with the development of antidepressants in the 1970s. Rather, they extend into the future and to future beneficiaries. In other words, while the number of animals used in those initial discoveries will remain constant as a historical fact, the number of individuals who continue to benefit will continue to increase. Another important thing to consider is this. Not only does the time scale for realized benefit extend into the future, but the range of interest holders or beneficiaries may also increase. For example, we can look to the use of insulin as a treatment for diabetes. The basic research depended on dogs, drug development and testing on cattle and rabbits and the initial beneficiaries were humans with diabetes. But at this point, that range has extended to include other animals. What post hoc analysis also tells us about evaluating the breadth of potential benefits and risk is that we would be foolish to think that we could accurately predict the full range of impact of a study or of a particular finding or discovery. Post hoc analysis, particularly of basic research, provides ample evidence of why analysis of potential benefits and harms of any single study will fall far short of the goal. That is, far short of the goal of guiding decisions about research in a manner that best protects public interest in scientific and medical advances. Post hoc analysis also illustrates the nature of science and how discoveries depend on previous knowledge and foundations. By doing so, it provides a robust illustration of why it is difficult, likely impossible, to determine the range of impact of a particular discovery. We can identify gaps in knowledge. And with expert knowledge of a field or specific area of understanding, we can determine that a missing piece of knowledge is critical in order to move forward and advance our understanding, to make further progress in meeting challenges to human, animal, societal, or environmental health. We can even hypothesize how filling a gap in knowledge or testing a hypothesis may advance our knowledge. While we know with certainty that science works and that the scientific process is among our very best way to advance knowledge, understanding, and make progress, we cannot say with certainty what the range of impact of a single study or a specific finding will be and on how many different fields. For example, in the case of serotonin, those initial studies and discoveries have had a range of impact that is remarkably broad. It includes all subsequent discoveries and applications that depend on knowledge of the neurochemical, its function, and identification of its roles. And that impact extends into the future. Overall, the discovery of serotonin demonstrates the value of basic research as well as the likelihood of unanticipated outcomes. Scientists working on an understanding of smooth mus muscle contraction and vasoconstriction would not have identified basic knowledge about brain chemistry and its contribution to mental health 
as the objective or rationale for their studies. Together then, consideration of the serotonin story should provide a cautionary note, and it's a caution against simple approaches to tallying potential harm and benefit of a single research project. Given that cautionary note and the complicated picture that emerges from post hoc analysis, what can we say about the topic of this webinar? How should we evaluate and convey our processes for evaluation of the balance of scientific objectives and consideration of animal welfare? First, that it is important not only to appreciate time scales and range of impact in the manner illustrated in the graphic here when considering research, but also to keep these facts in mind in conveying to the public the nature of science, animal research, and the ethical considerations that inform our decisions. The second conclusion should be that it is exactly this complicated picture that underscores why multiple types of expertise and multiple levels of review are so central to performing a meaningful and reasonable analysis. In particular, post hoc analysis highlights why specific content area expertise is necessary to best inform the evaluation of the potential impact of a study the potential value of testing a particular hypothesis, the value of studies that aim to fill a particular gap in knowledge, the value and importance of conducting work to know or better understand something as yet unknown, and in turn to assess how that new knowledge might open pathways for understanding and for progress that can benefit the public. In terms of review, those are exactly the types of questions that are addressed in researchers' selection of questions, in funding agencies' decisions, in expert scientific review of research proposals, and the publication of study findings. It is in this manner, together with the IACUC and all the other levels of review of proposals for animal research, that both the scientific objectives and animal welfare are critically evaluated for balance. I have focused largely on basic and translational research of the type that NIH funds. I will turn now to very briefly a broader consideration and acknowledgement that one size doesn't fit all. The use of animals in research and testing is actually quite broad. But the foundational questions that guide decisions about animal research are common. They're about weighing and balancing scientific objectives with animal welfare or potential benefits with potential risk. And these are the same regardless of whether a project is basic, translational, preclinical research, or testing. A second foundational question instantiated in policies for IACUC proposals is whether there are alternatives that are feasible to address the same question. For example, could a cell culture, computer simulation, or other approach be used? And it's for this question that it can often be important to remember key differences in types of animal use. In particular, it is important to realize that animal testing and animal research are not the same thing, and that this difference is relevant to ethical consideration and decisions. In particular, the estimation of benefits and risks differ in critical ways. This is especially true with respect to availability of suitable alternatives, but it is also in terms of time scales and range of impact. So what are some of those differences? Some critical differences are summarized and highlighted here, though we should be clear that there's some overlap. In terms of basic discovery science, animal research often has a goal of providing new knowledge to understand normal function and disease. It has long time scales, it delivers necessary building blocks for subsequent basic research, but also for translation and clinical application. In turn, without basic research, progress and new understanding halt. Animal testing differs in some important aspects. In general, when we talk about animal testing, we mean studies that evaluate the safety or efficacy of a treatment, drug, device, or product. Animal testing is often the focus of alternatives development, 
particularly in the case of toxicology studies, because some testing can be done without animals and some testing doesn't require novel discoveries. These key differences have some obvious implications for evaluation of proposed studies or uses of non-human animals. There are also differences that are sometimes not well understood or identified in public discussions of animal research. That is particularly true of the focus on alternatives, where there is often a lack of clarity about the fact that a growing number of alternatives for one application, toxicology for example, does not generalize to mean there are non-animal alternatives for basic discovery science. Well, in turn, consider this within the context of one of the goals we started out with, conveying to the public that animal research is subject to careful evaluation of scientific objectives balanced with consideration of animal welfare. To do that accurately, it is important that we are careful to be clear about where alternatives are possible, feasible, and useful, and where they simply do not exist and are unlikely to exist in the near future, if ever. To do otherwise, I think, is deeply misleading to the public, and ultimately, it is deeply harmful to public interest in both scientific discovery and in thoughtful partnership in the complex decisions that we make about research. Another way to think about this issue is in the context of something we often hear people say, even within our own community. And that is that we look forward to a day when no animals are involved in research. If we step back and think about the broad range of animal research, some of it represented here, we see the problem. Research is how we learn new things about the world and do so in a world that does not remain static. That is, environments, individuals, societies all change. And as a result, new questions and new challenges arise. Animal research includes studies of environmental impact, animal care and handling, clinical medicine for animals, basic biomedical science, studies of animal cognition, emotion, and behavior. Ending research closes a major path to discovery and understanding, and as such, I'd argue it's not a positive goal. And in other words, we also need to be clear about the diversity of animal research and its value, not only to humans, but also to other animals, society, and the environment. I'll turn now to the second set of questions that are examined in ethical consideration of animal research. These are the questions that are the primary focus of the IACUC that are most often and thoroughly discussed. It is here that we see the shorthand, three R's, replace, reduce, refine. After purpose and necessity are evaluated, we turn to the question of if the research is justified, then how is animals' welfare balanced with scientific objectives? The kinds of questions that are addressed surround providing humane care and treatment for animals, minimizing discomfort and harm, using the fewest number of animals that are needed without compromising the scientific objectives that justify the animal use in the first place. These are all topics that are the subject of extensive guidelines, regulation, rules, and discussion. For example, in the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals that serves as the rule book for all PHS and other federally funded research with rats, mice, birds, and the other animals that are additionally subject to the specification of care, handling, and conduct of research articulated in the Animal Welfare Act. When we turn to the question of risk, harms, and their evaluation, the factors that play a role typically involve consideration of diminished quality of life, pain, suffering, loss of potential, or death. In each case, two things are of concern to evaluate and guide decision making. One is acknowledging that risk and harms are part of understanding potential benefit, that is, what harm might be reduced as a result of the research findings and discoveries. We also think about the risk in terms of the welfare of animals in a study. We evaluate whether the procedures cause diminished quality of life, pain, or suffering, and what we can do to reduce those risks to animal welfare. In order to evaluate the impact of a, num a number of factors come into play, that includes the type, extent, degree, and amount of time that the animal might experience any potential for decreased welfare. 
This kind of analysis is represented in IACUC policy and in USDA categorization of research. For example, procedures are categorized as those that involve short-term limited pain, such as an injection, versus those that require anesthesia or pain relief in order to ensure that the animal does not experience pain or distress. And for a very small number of studies, those in category E, the analysis shows that scientific objectives cannot be met without animals experiencing unrelieved pain. In those cases, the balance of scientific objectives against animal welfare requires special consideration and every effort to minimize unnecessary pain and minimize the amount, duration, and degree of pain. In the evaluation of animals' welfare or potential harms, there is also consideration of differences between species, and there should also be a recognition of what we know and do not know. For example, similarities and differences between physiological systems and subjective experiences that are relevant to quality of life, pain, and suffering. Whether these are the same for all species, which is often not the case, and how those differences matter is a key consideration in our ethical framework for decisions about animal research and testing. It is also the basis for a key feature in our system, that is, the requirement to use the lowest species, using mice instead of monkeys, for example, the lowest species suitable to address the research question. It is also the basis for the requirement to justify the choice of species for a particular project. What is also true in this realm and in the realm of refinement of procedures, animal care and treatment, is that continuing advances in scientific understanding can result in changes in our views, procedures, and evaluation. So in summary, what can we say about the topic? Overall, what we know about the process of ethical consideration of animal research is that it is a complex analysis that involves unknowns and uncertainties, open questions, and ultimately, judgments that can impact the lives of many individuals, of society, of entire species, and the environment. There is no easy calculus or plug-and-play module that will deliver a meaningful number representing relative ratio of benefit to risk. What we also know, however, as scientists, members of the research community, members of the communities involved in research regulation and oversight, is that thoughtful and serious consideration of potential benefit and risk, informed by expert knowledge, occurs at multiple levels and at each stage of research. All of this together fulfills the public's interest in making sure that the use of animals in research and testing is ethically justified and that there's a serious, thoughtful, and multi-leveled process for evaluation of that justification. Another part of the obligation to the public, however, is communicating about the process, about how decisions are made, how the evaluation occurs, and its inherent limitations. Acknowledging those multiple levels of review and the interplay between them is critical to providing an accurate representation of the process of analysis that informs our decisions about research proposals. It is for that reason that I'll end by saying it is important to consider the IACUC's role in full and inclusive contexts and also to guard against the impression that we can do impossible things without risking harms to science and to society. And I'll thank you for your participation in this webinar, and thank you again very much to Olaf for organizing and hosting. And thank you, Allison. Now we will answer several questions that we received before the webinar. We will also welcome live questions from the audience. Please type them into the questions pane on your control panel now. If you think of a question later, you can send it to Ola at the email address shown on the slide. The first question, how do you conduct risk-benefit analysis with animals at the University of Wisconsin? 
I think similarly to many other universities. So at UW-Madison, much of our research is federally funded by NIH and other agencies. And as I've discussed here, it undergoes a rigorous review by expert scientific panels at the NIH. But in addition to that, our IACUC proposal requires the following are addressed. And each of these is part of the consideration and the factors I've talked about today. So for example, the rationale for the study, the potential benefits of the findings, justification for the choice of species in the research, justification for the animal numbers, a very detailed description of the procedures that allows for evaluation of potential for distress, pain, and a description of measures that are taken to minimize the risk of unnecessary distress and pain. So together with that information, the scientists, veterinarians, staff, and public members of the IACUCs can use the information to evaluate whether the scientific objectives are balanced with animal welfare and whether appropriate steps have been taken to minimize the risk of unnecessary distress or pain. Question two. Risk-benefit analysis is a complicated process with a lot of unknowns. Have people actually tried to develop a way to conduct an analysis using a scoring method or a mathematical approach? Uh, yes, there have been efforts to devise a categorical approach or a scoring approach. And I think here the question isn't whether a worksheet system or a categorization or scoring system could be devised it's whether that system would produce meaningful information. So in other words, would it improve decision making? Would it adequately protect the public interest in scientific progress? Because the converse is, would it lead to bad decision making with long-term negative consequences at worst, or at best, a simple increase in paperwork and burden without a compensatory benefit for scientific objectives, public interests, or animal welfare. So all of those harms, I think, should not be taken lightly, and they should be considered explicitly if one devises one of these systems. And I think that this process is one that requires thoughtful, serious deliberation with the appropriate range of expertise. I think one could also argue that it's a disservice to the public and to the research community to behave as though something that is impossible is a realistic goal. For example, predicting with accuracy the likely range of impact and benefit of the outcome of any single study. That just flies in the face of what we know about science. Do ICUC members at the University of Wisconsin-Madison engage in public outreach? Um, yeah, at UW-Madison we have a very broad and diverse set of public outreach education and engagement activities and those include efforts by a great many faculty, staff, and students and that would include IACUC members. Um, here's a question for Ola. What is OLA's expectation for risk-benefit analysis by IACUCs? So I'll answer that one. OLA expects that during its deliberative process, the IACUC um, will ensure a thoughtful analysis of the risk to animals balanced against the potential benefits of the research. Principle two of the U.S. government principles guides IACUCs to ensure that uh, procedures involving animals are designed and performed with consideration of their relevance to human or animal health, the advancement of knowledge, or the good of society. The guide states in the first chapter that the decision to use animals in research requires critical thought, judgment, and analysis, and that using animals in research is a privilege granted by society to the research community with the expectation that such use will provide either significant new knowledge or lead to improvement in human or animal well-being. The guide expects IACUCs to weigh the objectives of the study against potential animal welfare concerns. And here's another question for Ola. What is the position of the guide 
for the care and use of laboratory animals on scientific merit review. The guide offers the following guidance for IACUCs on scientific merit review. While the responsibility for scientific merit review normally lies outside the IACUC, the committee members should evaluate scientific elements of the protocol as they relate to the welfare and use of the animals. For example, hypothesis testing, sample size, group numbers, and adequacy of controls can relate directly to the prevention of unnecessary animal use or duplication of experiments. For some IACUC questions, input from outside experts may be advisable or necessary. In the absence of evidence of a formal scientific merit review, the IACUC may consider conducting or requesting such a review. And now we have uh, some questions that have come in uh, from the audience. In search of AWA, AWAR, HREA, and uh, the PH policy for ethics, ethical finds no requirements for ethical justification. A question as to whether OLA is now going to stress ethical justification of animal research activities rather than uh, scientific justification. Okay, so the way this reads to me is this individual uh, searched the databases for the word ethical or ethics and uh, they determined uh, there was no requirement. Uh, so Ola's answer is, uh, we, we did address this just a moment ago in question four. The U.S. government principle four and the guide provide the expectation that the IACUC considers the balance between the benefits and risks of a research protocol. Um, and now um, here is one that came in for you, Allison. Um, if the time scale is decades, how does an IACUC evaluate the benefits? The IACUC can identify the likely benefits by thinking about whether the research project, the research question is well formulated, whether the methods and the approaches used are likely to succeed in answering and addressing that hypothesis. So they can evaluate the likelihood that the study will succeed. They can evaluate whether it is a good question to ask, whether the knowledge is likely to be useful. What they can't do is predict the range of benefit, the depth of benefit, or the potential application of the finding. And we're, we're bumping up against our timeline. We do have one more uh, question for you, Allison. Uh, this uh, commenter says, very nice presentation. ALAS and um, Philasa just published two articles on performing a harm-benefit analysis. The rationale is a presumption that this term, harm, is in the guide. This only term used in the guide is risk-benefit. Risk-benefit has served the biomedical community well. Risk puts the definition of pain, distress, and welfare that is linked to the three R's. It is objective and well-defined. In contrast, harm is not well-defined for animal research. Harm is subjective. For human clinical trials, harm is defined as a risk. It includes mental health and economic earning potentials as well as pain and distress. Harm also includes a definition of wrongdoing and evil. Using the term harm will deter the public understanding of the benefits of animal research. Your presentation of informing the public on the benefits and ethics of animal research and how investigators mitigate the risks with ethics, compassion, the three R's that balance with scientific objectives. And this uh, commenter um, encourages using the term risk rather than harm. 
Uh, do you want to comment on that, Allison? I think that's an excellent point, and I, I agree. I appreciate the commenter's articulation of that. And I think what's happened is we have a lot of these different terms floating around out there, and the commenter's point is one that probably should encourage us to be a little bit more thoughtful about why we're using the terms we're using, and for the case of animal research, to use the term risk and not harm. So point well taken. Okay, well, we will all try to do that. And we've come to the end of our webinar. Um, my great thanks to Dr. Allison J. Bennett for a fascinating, thought-provoking, interesting talk. And I thank all of you for participating in our webinar with special thanks to those who sent in their questions. We look forward to continuing an exciting 2016 webinar series. The next OLA online se seminar will be on September 8th when we will discuss implementing veterinary verification and consultation, or VVC, uh, of significant change guidance. Uh, we also have another online seminar scheduled for December 15th on self-evaluating and reporting. I feel like I should sing this to you, but I won't. Always let the guide be your conscience. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you for joining us today.